Yo, my peoples, what's up? My name is Jason, and I'm from the Shelf Stories YouTube channel. And I'm here in the Dice Tower today to review Freedom, the Underground Railroad. This one was designed by Brian Mayer and published by Academy Games in 2012. 2012 is a very long time ago uh, to take a, a look at a game like this. However, uh, a couple of reasons. One, it's February 2021. It's Black History Month. Uh, a little bit of a nod to that to uh, take a fresh look at uh, a game that is very, that has a lot to say uh, in that space uh, within the, the Black experience, especially in America. Uh, this is a game about helping liberate slaves from the South to the North, from, from captivity to freedom. Generally, you're going to be playing as an abolitionist. Uh, so you're going to be uh, managing resources and getting money and trying to move slaves uh, from one end of the board to the other. And you have some opposition that I'll describe in a minute. So clearly, very difficult topic to discuss, very difficult game to present. But I felt that was important because people are talking about it again because of everything that's happening in the last couple of years, especially here uh, in the Western world. So I'm gonna try to make this as much about gameplay as I can. I think people wanna know. Uh, it, it's a cooperative game it as um, you know, uh, money, economic uh, part. Is, it, you wanna look at that stuff. And I think that's very important to present. I've, play, I've been playing this game consistently ever since it was released in 2012. So you know, I have a lot to say about mechanisms and that's where the video is gonna focus. I am going to try to uh, address some of the issues, <laughs> context, uh, some of the controversy that this game has caused. Uh, and I'm going to try to do it in as open and non-confrontational way as possible, uh, honoring people's perspectives and you know, just giving a couple of thoughts about why I think this game is uh, really important to talk about. I put this game in a, seri a new series that I'm calling Games for an Informed Mind. Uh, games that have something to say, especially from the historical record, and that can teach us things that we can bring you know, uh, forward in our gaming lives and our regular lives. So um, I hope that all makes sense. The last thing I'm going to um, say, uh, give a flag for is I do refer to the individual player pieces as slaves. That's how the game refers to those pieces. There's a movement now to um, call them enslaved persons, to change the nomenclature to kind of highlight the agency and the humanity of uh, of the people that were subject to this reality. And I'm com I'm completely aware of that. I'm, I'm definitely uh, sensitive to that issue. I, I just wanted to call them slaves because that's what the game calls them. And I wanted to be clear so that people aren't kind of ha don't have a disconnect in terms of the terminology. But they want to uh, flag that, especially as I get into the walkthrough. So here is the walkthrough. Here's the game of the table. Without further ado, let's go to the videotape, and then I'll come back and I'll tell you all about Freedom, the Underground Railroad. Welcome to Freedom, the Underground Railroad laid out at the table. As you can see, it's a pretty big board. You're looking at like an Arkham Horror size board over here, six panels. This is where the main area happens. Uh, this is more of a sideboard where resource gathering is going to happen. There's a separate phase for that. This is mostly where you are going to be spending your time and attention at the table. I've laid out a two-player game, so these are the player areas uh, with some powers that I'm going to show you when I get to the actual playthrough. Just in terms of the main flow, what you're going to be doing and how you win, these individual wooden pieces represent uh, uh, individual slave markers. They're just marker stand-ins, intentionally abstract, uh, so they don't depict uh, anything <laughs> un untoward uh, in that area, but these represent the individual slaves fleeing from the plantation spaces. So then as the game progresses, I'm going to try to engage in some point-to-point -point movement, and I'm going to try to avoid the slave catcher pieces. This is the game's main opposition. There are five of them, and they are going to be moving around, uh, and I'll show you that also in a second. As the game progresses, you're going to want to move point-to-point -point and eventually uh, escape into Canada in the, the game's world. Canada is where freedom uh, is guaranteed for each individual slave piece and they're going to be placed here along a tracker. This uh, will tell you how many slaves you need to free in order to achieve victory. This is for a two-player game. There's hard mode for two-player game and then there's threshold for one, two, three, and four players. So that is how you, that's the basic action, in how you win a game of freedom. Let me go ahead and break down uh, turn by turn uh, a full round and then uh, we can get on with it. 
So this is the sideboard. Uh, this is the second phase of a turn, but I wanted to uh, zero in on this because this is how uh, the game engine kind of goes. The main piece that you can acquire here, uh, or any player, uh, for two bucks, three bucks, or four bucks, depending on what era you're in, is this movement token. So then a player acquires a movement token, and on the turn they're going to play it. This would mean you would move three of the slave pieces one place each as you move through different eras. They get a little bit more powerful. You get two out of two, and then eventually three out of two, which is a pretty significant chunk. You'll notice that this one's a little bit of a different color. This is always the last piece in a pile. You can never run out, so you're always going to have at least one uh, in order to play with. So then you, the players are going to be acquiring that. They can also acquire these fundraising tokens, and I'll show you how that works when I get back to the main board. But this is the, the main money generator of the game. Going to need a lot of money because for $10 in-game, and that's a lot, that's a lot of money, you are going to be acquiring this support token. Thematically, it represents the growing support that the, um, the North and the entire uh, Americas has for the abolitionist cause and acquiring these and moving that out is going to move the eras forward. Now, once I've acquired all that, I would open up these tokens, same thing, acquire all that, open up these tokens. These cards will also open up as the different eras come on. Uh, this uh, comes into play uh, during a later phase, so I'll just show you that when uh, we go back to the main board. Welcome back to the table. I'm gonna demonstrate a full round. Of action. So the first thing that's going to happen is I'm going to roll the slave catcher die. So then this would roll, and what that would mean is uh, I would look for the individual uh, shape that is depicted, and then I would move them one, two in the direction either towards white, which is west, or a black, which is east. In this case, they would do nothing, but let's say it had loomed down there and is ready to capture the slave piece that I'm about to move. So that's the first round. Second round will be the planning phase, acquiring those resources I just told you about. Third phase is actually putting that into practice. So then I'm gonna play this token, which lets me move three of the slave pieces, one square each. So I'm gonna move that one over there, which is perfectly fine. Move that one over there, also perfectly fine because I'm not in the line of the uh, slave catchers. However, if I moved this piece over here, I would get a board response, which is this brown piece would move a little bit further down the track because this brown, it is along the brown area. I could have moved this piece, but that would have meant that the slave catcher would have captured the slave piece. And in this particular case, it would return it to the market. You would have to deal with that uh, at the later phase of the round. So I definitely want to avoid that fate as much as possible. A couple of other options on your turn. You can also play this fundraising token. Let's say the game state was progressed a little bit further, and I had a couple of pieces here on the uh, green area, which represents the south. What the fundraising token would do is I would get one dollar for every uh, every uh, slave piece inside of this area. So it'd be one, two, three, four, five. Get five money. Move on about my day. Every character has a card, and they will have a power. So it would get plus one money during the action phase, and also move two slaves, one space each during the action phase. So it, in addition, there's always going to be additional movement. I'm gonna move like that, get a board response, move there. There is once per game, every single card has a special power. In this particular case, it would be during your action, use five movements for one, for one or more slaves, which would be really, really uh, crazy power. Uh, save that for <laughs> good stuff because you are uh, once you use that, then you have like a less diminished version of your ongoing power. Uh, so definitely use that wisely. Not every character works like that. Some of them even get better <laughs> when you use that power. So a little bit of a gamer button to pull, but once per game. Last thing you're to be able to do in a, a particular turn is acquire an abolition card. So I have the abolition card over here. You would pay that cost and you basically just do what it says. Most of them are one shots and they depend on the era that you acquire the card in. So you would either, in this particular case, move two slaves, one space each, or purchase a token at a $2 discount. Um, you know, pretty flexible, adds a little bit of dynamism to your turn. You would use that and then get rid of it. Some of the cards stick with you. You could do that, or you can try to deal with these bad cards. So 
In this particular case, it says resolve when removed, which is removed. Uh, this will move as the market moves to the end of the round. Add two slaves to each slave market's card currently on the board. That would be here, and that would be no bueno. Don't like that one. So those are your options on the turn. Once you everybody has gone their past turn, then you would be responsible for emptying one of these market cards. So then for the most part, in the beginning of the game, it is okay. You'll be able to have a lot of space to move pieces, move that down, get more pieces to fill up over here. However, if you are not able to fill the plantations, if you have not managed the spaces here well, whatever you cannot place goes into the slave's lost pile, which is the game's main lose condition. So in this case, if 16 pieces go onto this card, uh, this little uh, thing over here, then you would lose. But we're not gonna think about losing. <laughs> we're gonna think about winning. So for the most part, what's gonna happen is you're gonna try to move the pieces in such a way that the, um, the board responds and you're able to uh, you're able to create opportunities for other pieces to move so let's say that there was a piece over here it could move up here and it would let's see it's on the blue line and it would draw this piece over here which would which might open up room for this piece to make a move and get to canada over there so you're definitely a, a case of you know board action reaction action reaction it's kind of the uh, name of the game you're gonna refill the market row, and then a new turn starts. Will the slave catcher die again? Uh, eight rounds is over. Hopefully, you have reached your threshold, and you will have won Freedom, the Underground Railroad. So that was Freedom, the Underground Railroad at the table. Normally, how I like to discuss games is break them down in terms of what I call the strategic headspace and the thematic headspace. Like I said at the intro of the video, I'm gonna talk about mechanisms, decision space from playing freedom, just at the table as a game experience. So it's a very mechanical game. A lot of co-ops are, right? A lot of cooperative games uh, and solo games. In some ways, this is kind of a solo game scaled up. <laughs> uh, for, uh, for multiple players, and I'll have something to say about that in a second. But it's a very you know, mechanical game. I've, it, it definitely reflects cooperative design in 2012, where the the, the essence is simplicity. You know, they, they want that very simple turns, very simple enemy reaction, and, you know, go back and forth. And the way this goes is it's very mechanical in the way, like, especially when you're moving the slave pieces. So then you move a slave piece, generally and then there's a, a um an opposition piece the slave catcher which moves move move but move move and then you're know, over here move move <laughs> you know and you're it's almost like um the theme disappears at least for me during that that movement phase it, it disappears pretty quickly and it's almost like i'm, I'm playing with gears you know um so to speak you know it's everything just kind of like feeds back off of one another very very uh, a very very evocative way the theme injects itself, I think, uh, at least for me, in two main areas. One, when you acquire the slave pieces, and the other, when you lose them. So they both of those actions happen in, in stage five. So stage five is uh, you begin the slave market phase by importing and trying to put as many slave pieces as possible in the plantations. So the, the game, I'm not really sure if the designer really intended this, but it, it, you know, in the Atlantic Ocean, bringing it in, just kind of, it, it's very evocative of the slave trade, which is, you're already in a difficult space anyway, so I don't know if that was, uh, I don't know if that could have been just done on a separate board or something, just to kind of you give a little bit more distance, but I don't know. It, it's very, very hard to separate theme and mechanism at that point. And then when you can't put the, the slave pieces on plantations, you put them in the lost pile. And that's very tough. That's very difficult. Um, that, that, is a, that is basically the exact point where uh, I, I know a lot of gamers who have said, nope, not, no, 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 no. Not engaging with this game whatsoever. Uh, definitely understandable choice. Um, so that's the, that's the part of the game where I feel like the theme inject itself into the mechanisms. The rest of it, it's, it's, you know, basic fare, getting the, 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 the money, exchanging it for pieces to move stuff, moving the slate pieces around, acquiring cards. 
you know, this is basic mechanical game, you know, fair. So how is it? Is it fun? Depends on your fun. Uh, you know, 100%. It's good. Uh, and I'll, I'll, let me, I'll go with the, the, the quality I enjoy first. Um, I'm a solo slash cooperative gamer. I'm a low player account gamer. This game presents a puzzle, a turn by turn puzzle. And I really like that. I really enjoy puzzling out the right way to get um, slave pieces out on the board such that I can maximize my fundraising token. Because if there's enough uh, pieces on the relevant spaces, then boom, fundraising, you know, get a bunch of money and I'll set myself up to the, for the future. Uh, that's cool. Um, I really enjoy, I think this is maybe the core experience of like, you have a, you're trying to uh, have a couple of pieces and you want to move one, let's say you're moving one up the East coast, move a slave catcher away and then open the way for, uh, another piece to move on the other side. So it's kind of like you're manipulating the opposition, uh, in order to make room for certain pieces to escape, uh, as a puzzle, very satisfying. I've had some very, um, awesome poignant at uh, what i call puzzle to pay off ratios where i'll be sitting there it's like mm, i can't figure this out uh the game presented me with something that i'm not really mm, sure how to crack i take you know some time which in a low player count situation one or two players you can then you know and eventually it's like oh didn't see that before try that do it bang pay off puzzle it out uh the puzzle went in payoff came out very very, very fun. That's the that's where my fun comes in with this game. So that's not everybody's fun. Uh, I think there are three points of difficulty here. So uh, number one, it's not that dynamic a puzzle. Um, you have that one, the uh, the opening phase where you roll the die and then the, the opposition piece, the slave catcher moves, creating a little bit of uh, randomness in, you know, what you're... Um, going against however sometimes th th they don't move or or they, they sometimes they don't move uh and sometimes you know a piece moves and it wasn't it didn't even matter so it doesn't really jiggle up the board as much as you might want if you want a more varied experience um the cards also create variability but you, you know after a couple of plays you've seen basically you've seen them all um and you don't have that like Oh wow! I'm gonna I'm gonna do this differently this time because it was the same option <laughs> that he presented, you know, two or three games ago. Um, so, in terms of a dynamic, repeatable um, puzzle that presents something radically different every time, not gonna get it. I think this is a, a difficult cooperative game at a higher player count, three and four. I just think uh, more than maybe more than any other cooperative game I played, it's wide open to alpha player. I'm not a person that like says that alpha player is like this horrible problem that a cooperative game should solve. I think uh, alpha player is more of a player problem than a, a a game problem. However, you don't get any individual player piece in this game. You don't really have individual resources except for your personal board. So you're going to have this tendency to boss people around where you have a fundraising token and someone goes in front of you, you're going to be like, oh, I want to use this fundraising token. Please go ahead, move the slaves here, here, and here, and I'm going to, you know, pop my fundraising token. Or I, I have this, you know, I have a, a good move. I can move that individual piece to Canada. Uh, so please, you know, please, you set me up, move the opposition over there so I can move my piece around. You don't have to listen, but the tendency is there, really strong, to just, uh, <laughs> want to have everybody move the pieces around uh very very strong in this game it, it reflects kind of earlier cooperative design that didn't really account for and bake into the game things like limited communication or you know individual resources that are shielded from other players different things that that further cooperative games have done this is just like all right here you go <laughs> um so that's a little bit of a difficulty as well. I think those are the kind of two main things. Um, and I guess like uh, I'll add a third thing on there. Is this, uh, does this game have legs? Is this game gonna be replayable after the fourth, fifth, sixth time? Connected to uh, how dynamic the puzzle is. Um, but, you know, is the, the core experience. Like, you know, there are people who can play simple games uh, forever because they like the core experience. I would say that you have to like the core experience. You have to like that that puzzle to payoff ratio, moving the pieces and everything. 
if you you know if it's iffy for you, I don't think this game is going to have a lot for you moving down. Um, however, it, that is my fun. As a gamer, love puzzles, love the movement. I love movement puzzles. Uh, <laughs> I don't mind that there isn't a, a huge dynamism because I think there's enough to satisfy me. And I, I don't play this game 50 times. I'll play it, you know, three, four, five times, put it away for a while, bring it back. Oh, I'm back in this world. I'm back in this space. The, the, the mechanical version of the world anyway. Uh, so it's a game I'm going to be playing. I'm going to keep playing for a long time. But I keep on playing it with, if it had a, a much different theme, or a much different setting, I should say. I'll say more about that later. Uh, if it wasn't um, in the antebellum South during the Civil War, uh, would I be as emotionally attached to this game? I, I, I can't say. I, I, I really can't say. Um, what I can say is the the fact that I'm coming back at it 11 years later, uh, or what's how long has it been? Uh, 2012? Uh, nine years. Nine years later. I am still coming back to it. It's not a game that I've let drop off. There are games that deal with issues that I've let drop off because the mechanical guts of it isn't that strong. Here, it's my fun. It's my puzzly fun. So that's freedom from a gaming perspective. So what about the theme? I want to contextualize this by saying it actually drives me a little bit nuts when... People say this is a, a game with a theme of slavery. Uh, and I get exactly where people are coming from, the, the art style and everything here evokes, you know, the antebellum South, pre-Civil War, all that kind of thing. But the I, I distinguish between setting and theme, and I owe that particular distinction to Mr. Paul Grogan from Gaming Rules. Thank you very much for giving me a very uh, good tool to kind of distinguish some things. I think the setting is the antebellum south and uh, during the civil war freedom uh the underground railroad right i think the theme is liberation from captivity so different i mean uh, to me freedom it's right there in the title this is this game is not called slavery the underground railroad this game is called freedom the underground railroad the core action of the game the 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 it's so suffused not only the art style, but the mechanisms. It is a, the, the mechanisms and the art style together evoke liberation, freedom, resistance. Uh, to me, thematically, that's what makes this game so magical. I, it, you know, a game about slavery, a game with a, a, a core action where you're either, I don't even want to enter into that brain space. If I'm going to enter into slavery at all as a, as a gamer, I want to enter it in terms of people's, you know, connecting with people's struggle to be free and to liberate themselves and to have, you know, help along the way. And that's, that's where I want to be. And that's, to me, is the theme of the game. So I distinguish setting from theme. This game could have a different setting. And as, as maybe strange as it is to say, uh, I was thinking about this. It's like, you know, okay, let, I'm taking out the, the antebellum South part and I want to make this game about liberation. Could I do it? And, you know, just as a complete thought, uh, thought experiment, don't mean no disrespect about this at all. Like, what if this game was about the, the little uh, three-eyed aliens in Toy Story, and they're still the little plush toys, and they're in that little um, the the booth with the claw coming in. So like you have the opposition pieces, the shapes that are like the claw, and they're moving around, and you're trying to escape with the little uh, aliens over here, <laughs> you know. And I could totally, you know, with some retrofits and mechanical tweaks, change that, and I have the soul of what this game is all about. This game is about. To me, liberation from from captivity, that freedom, the Underground Railroad. It, to me, that's what this game is all about, and that's why this game will always be part of my collection, uh, both from, from a mechanical perspective and from a thematic perspective. So I could say that, right? <laughs> but we're, here we are. The game is presenting us with, you know, um, the the theme that it, the the setting that it is, the Antebellum South. So. There's a couple of um, issues that I'll say uh, about that particular setting. Should we make games about slavery at all? That is a very, very legitimate question. Um, I think that if you're going to defend this game, you're going to defend it on the ground that it has educational value. 
Uh, since its release in 2012, it has been disseminated and shared uh, with, you know, high schools, high school settings, middle school, I think even, you know, they've, even some school districts have, you know, made it part of their curriculum uh, in terms of, you know, the instruction and dissemination. Uh, I think that there are people that are finding value in this. The counter argument is that it's a game and you might be getting the wrong lesson from having it in a game. And I think that's an open discussion. I don't want to come down one way or the other. Uh, and I think that I would like to have help encourage and continue that discussion framed in the right way. Is, is this game uh, provide enough educational value where you know we continue to exist and present it? Or is it one of those things where you look at it, it causes so many issues, it, it brings up so much trauma for people that it probably shouldn't, wasn't, wasn't a good idea? I'll frame the discussion, open it up to anybody who wants to talk about it. But that, I think that's kind of where you're going in terms of answering that question of whether this game, quote unquote, should exist or not. And then another issue um, is the fact that, you know, in 2012, Academy Games, the designer is a white person, uh, publisher, artist, everybody involved in the project, the production of the project, that, uh, who uh, gets profit from the project are uh, um, Caucasian American, right? <laughs> white. And yeah, that's a big problem. I think that's a big problem full stop. I don't know if that's a, uh, I don't think that's up for too much debate that, you know, it's a problem that only um, white people were uh, at, at the making of this game. Does that mean that further games can't be explored in this space? I think um, a, the most constructive answer is we need to open things up as much as possible. Maybe this is, you know, part of why I'm making the whole video. Uh, I would love to see uh, blacks, uh, Latinos like myself, uh, Latina, um, different voices, different uh, perspectives, making these games, profiting from these games, employed because they are, you know, involved in the production of these games and let the chips fall where they may. You know, if they want to make games from their personal perspective, they want to make games from, you know, culture, a different, that, that, you know, grapples with these kind of difficult issues, then... You know, I'd love to see what would happen if people from w more diverse perspectives makes games like this. I'm very glad Freedom opened that door. You know, I'm very glad people, you know, this is a much different perspective than a colonial game. We are playing the colonist perspective. This just completely flips it on its head. I'd love to see more of that. People try uh, more of that. Uh, and diverse people. You know, people from much more diverse backgrounds. Uh, so that everybody can get in, get in on uh, the you know, what we're doing <laughs> uh, in terms of gaming and exploring that space. I know uh, I seem to have tipped my hand in terms of the, the previous question, whether these games should exist or not. Clearly, if I'm presenting it, I'm talking about it. I think the games like this should exist. Respectful, honoring history, all that kind of thing. Um, but I do want to honor the other side and have a, and invite folks to a discussion. So final thoughts time. Uh, Seal of Excellence, 9 out of 10. This game is, for many reasons, uh, just an irreplaceable game for me. Uh, so me mechanism-wise, it is my fun, right? I'm not just talking about this as a culture piece. I think, you know, mechanism-wise, is a puzzle. It's friendly to a low player count. It has an amazing puzzle-to-payoff ratio. Uh, it, when you, you sit there and you puzzle off a turn and you could, you know, you figure it out, and you, you know, you get what you want to get. It's like, yes! Oh, and that's what I want out of my games. I want that yes! And it, it passes the yes and the smile test for me with flying colors as a game. Take the setting out of it. Make this game about three-eyed aliens escaping from the, the claw, and I'm still probably going to be pretty satisfied with it, um, at least from a mechanical perspective. Might be a little, it'll be lower than nine, uh, but it, really, there's a lot of fun here for a gamer like me. Low player count, friendly to cooperative, um, has its issues. Is how replayable is it? How dynamic is it? Um, is it friendly to higher player counts? Hopefully, I've, I've articulated those reasons. You can evaluate for yourself whether this game is your fun or whether it's not. Um, Theme-wise, of course, just brings it up uh, uh, many, many levels for me and is what makes it, brings it from a, a good, enjoyable, fun, repeatable experience to just something that is, whew, <laughs> 
I, I think should exist, but I'm definitely open to many, many more discussions about this. Uh, discussions that I've had, you know, uh, leading up to this and discussions that I invite folks to uh, continue to participate in. Uh, Shelf Stories is my YouTube channel. I have a lot more uh, coverage uh, uh, along uh, the lines of Freedom the Underground Railroad and uh, along the lines of Black History Month. We're just getting started here. Got a couple of videos um, celebrating that. And I'll tell you, you know, I, I go into why that is important to me and some of that other stuff. So if you want to, if you're curious about that, it's like, why is, uh, uh, you know, a Latino person talking about Black History Month so much? I answer that question on my channel in different videos. Um, also, uh, Twitter, Shelf Stories GBL. My Twitter handle, user is Pope Sixtus. I'm opening the doors, people. I am an open book about this stuff. As long as it's respectful, as long as we can mutually share uh, our perspectives and we honor each other and we don't let things kind of devolve into straw man or Twitter flame or whatever it is, I'm more than happy uh, to engage in something very fruitful. So this is Jason reminding you, if you change your mind, you can change the world. If you can inform your mind, it's another way to change the world as well. So until next time, later, everybody.